Let the Right Prevail, Naperville versus Wheaton in the DuPage County Seat War. Uh, this is an editorial from the October 1870 issue of the Naperville Clarion, which was about the upcoming uh, county elections. Quote, what we want is a man the people of the southern towns and their friends in the north can trust. A man that has always been a true Naperville man, be he Jew or Gentile, saint or sinner, Republican or Democrat, circumcised or uncircumcised. As long as the county seat question is at issue, we must hang together. Don't be too particular about the men, but keep in view the object to be obtained. For five years, the overriding issue, perhaps the only political issue in DuPage County, was the location of the county seat. Would it be at Naperville or Wheaton? Tonight, let me share with you what I've discovered about the DuPage County seat war. Settlement in what became DuPage did not start in any serious way until the 1830s. Captain Joseph Naper and his brother John were the foremost leaders in founding the community called Naperville in 1831. The area was then part of Cook County. Joseph Naper was elected to the Illinois State Legislature in 1836, and on February 9, 1839, successfully led the effort to form a new county seat out of the western part of Cook. The same act that created the county also stated that three commissioners would be appointed to select a new county seat. Julius Warren of Warrenville lobbied for his town in the north to be the county seat, but the commissioners met in Naperville and they chose Naperville on June 17, 1839. Morris Slate, who was a developer and promoter, pledged three acres for the county courthouse in Naperville, and Joseph Naper uh, got pledges of $3,000 to build it. I mean, the choice was almost inevitable. Naperville was the largest, had the largest population and the greatest wealth at that time. Also, the act creating the county had given the two northernmost townships of Will County, immediately to the south, the option of joining DuPage if they wished. If this happened, Naperville would be close to the center of the county. In addition to these advantages, Naperville was on a, one of the main means of transportation and communication, the DuPage River. In the early days, rivers were the easiest and in some cases the only way to travel and to move products to market. The men of Naperville also played a part in creating a second important means of transportation. The first roads in the area that became DuPage were laid out in 1834 by three county cook commissioners, one of whom was Joseph Naper. It formed a junction with a road running from Ottawa, Illinois, to the southwest. At this junction in the same year, the preemption house was built in Naperville, and it's still standing today. But roads in those days were only strips of slightly deeper mud. In 1846, Morris Slay uh, headed a stock company that planned to build a wooden toll road known as the Southwestern Plank Road, going east and west through Naperville roughly along the route of what is Ogden Avenue today. Joseph Naper was also an investor, as were many prominent people in Naperville. Every carriage with four horses would be charged 50 cents to ride this road. Every head of cattle paid four cents, every sheep, three cents. The road was initially seemed well worth the money and labor invested in it. As one stockholder, James Hunts recalled, quote, we thought we had a good thing in the beginning. Our town was always crowded with farmers on their way to Chicago. This was the only good road into the city. The stream of teams never ended. However, there were setbacks for Naperville. The same year the county was formed, the election was held in northern Will County to decide whether they wanted to join DuPage or not. You see them there at the top. One is called Wheatland, and the other is called DuPage. But DuPage uh, did not vote to join DuPage. Uh, the election to, uh, to move to DuPage County lost by one vote. So Naperville was now in the southwest corner of the county. 1848 brought what turned out to be another setback. Railroads were coming to Illinois. A line was planned between Chicago and Galena. The promoters of this line were seeking land and rights of way. The stockholders of the Plank Road saw no need to encourage this kind of competition. As James Hunt recalled, quote, we told them we would not have their railroad if we could help ourselves by any available law. If we couldn't, we would cause them no end of trouble and expense by letting our cattle run loose. 
thus compelling them to fence in their tracks. About seven miles to the north, the railroad promoters got a very different reception. Milton Township is in the center of DuPage. It was first settled in 1831 when Erastus and Charles Gary were among the early residents. In 1837, Warren Wheaton came to the area and he was quickly joined by his brother, Jesse. The reaction of the Wheaton brothers and the Garys was the opposite of that of the citizens of Naperville when the railroad men came calling. They were welcomed with open arms, given a good dinner, and the Garys and Wheaton did everything they could to make their route through their community attractive. They gave away a three-mile right-of-way to the railroad, with the result that by 1848 the tracks were being laid, and by 1849 the railroad was going back and forth between Milton and Chicago. Within a very brief time, the superiority of rail over planks asserted itself. To quote James Hunts again, one last time, but lo, one clear morning we woke up to the fact that we had our plank road, but we had no traffic. The wheat was rolling into Chicago over the rails. Imagine our feeling when we heard the shriek of the locomotives up there at Wheaton, close quote. The Galena and Chicago, in gratitude for the Wheaton brothers' support, named the railroad station they put in their brothers' community, Wheaton, after them, and that became the name of the town it incorporated in 1859. The Wheaton brothers were also instrumental in bringing another institution to their town. They offered free land to the congregational denomination, which was looking for a place to train their clergy. In 1853, the Illinois Institute was opened. In 1860, the school was reorganized as a private school called Wheaton College, with Jonathan Blanchard as the first president. Wheaton was now a community with institutions, first and foremost, a college and a railroad. It began to see itself as the economic, population, educational, and geographic center of DuPage County. Wheatonites and others in the north of the county began to agitate to move to county seat. It was in 1855 that the opening shot in the county seat war was fired. A northerner introduced a bill in the state legislature to move the seat. Protest letters poured in from uh, Joseph Naper and other prominent settlers as well as personal lobbying in Springfield by Naperville businessman, George Martin. All this uh, intensive effort defeated this first attempt. In December of the next year, 1856, another bill appeared in the state legislature to move the county seat. A notice of that effect appeared in Wheaton's newspaper, the DuPage uh, County Gazette, which had just been founded for the express purpose of moving the county seat. The notice was signed by a Wheaton citizen coming into prominence, Henry Clay Childs. Rufus Blanchard, historian of DuPage County, called Childs a man, quote, of ambitious ideas, end quote. Olin J. Gary, uh, of the prominent Gary family, called him, quote, a booster and an adventurer. Jonathan Blanchard delicately said he was a man, quote, capable of very loose reasoning about legal matters, end quote. <laughs> His own self-description recorded in the 1870 census was speculator. He is virtually forgotten now in Wheaton, but for a brief time, he was one of its most important citizens. He was born in New England in 1829, the seventh of nine children, and he was an orphan by the age of 10. According to an entry in a biographical dictionary written many years later, he, quote, early entered the College of Human Experience and does not intend to be graduated until about the age of 90, close quote. <laughs> about 1853, he moved to Wheaton. The bill to hold an election to decide whether to move to county to Wheaton became law on February 7th, 19, 1857, and the election was scheduled for April 7th. The pro-Naperville forces circulated the pamphlet with 20 reasons for not moving. The main ones were that a move was unnecessary, it would result in additional taxes, and finally, the county was so young, it was quite possible the boundaries would move, and then Wheaton would not be in the center. On a positive note, the Naperville's acknowledged the courthouse was inadequate and promised to uh, pay for improvements that were paid for solely by Naperville. The pro-Wheaton forces, in their 1856 petition, wrote, quote, the public buildings of the county will soon have to be rebuilt, and in the opinion of your petitioners, 
We believe the interests of the county require the county seat to be relocated and the inhabitants should be uh, better accommodated by the removal from Naperville to a more central position in the county and upon the line of the Galena and Chicago Union Railroad. In 1857, at least, anybody in the northern part of the county had to, who had to go to Naperville would need to make a two-day round trip to get there and back because of the bad roads. Wheaton was about equal distance from every place, so it was no closer than any place else in the county. Meanwhile, the Gazette claimed that Naperville was sending men once again to Springfield to lobby and had raised a fund of $1,500 to buy votes. When the election was finally held, um, Naperville won by about 58% of the vote, getting 1,347 out of the 2,307 votes cast. Most of the pro Wheaton forces came from the towns along the railroad. There was a complaint that Naperville and Lyle had cast almost 300 more votes in 1857 than they had in 1856. Between 1858 and 1861, petitions continued to come to the state legislature to move the seat to a northern town. Wheaton or Babcock Grove, which is present day Lombard, Danbury, which is present day Glen Ellen, or Fredericksburg, present day Winfield. Then, for the next five years, everybody's attention was absorbed in the National Civil War. So what was the furor about? I should say that DuPage was not even slightly unusual in having a county seat war. There were hundreds of them in the 19th century, particularly in the Midwest. In 1859, in Illinois alone, eight other counties besides DuPage presented petitions to the state legislature to move their county seats. You have to remember, too, that in 1857, DuPage is looking a few miles to the east saw Chicago, which had once consisted of one cabin, where Naperville had two cabins. And now, in 1857, Chicago was becoming a world-class metropolis. Who is to say that Naperville or Wheaton could not have similar miraculous growth? Town founders covered every, coveted every possible advantage and were boosters of their community. A county seat would bring the courthouse and the county clerk and business and travelers it was an asset, and not one to be thrown away once acquired. James A. Schellenberg, the historian of county seat changes, writes, quote, the partisanship between the county seat contest expressed a location, expressed a localism of uh, present identification and future hope. The booster spirit had been nurtured by the conditions of rapid settlement and development and expressed itself in expansive optimism about things in general and the prospects of one own, one's own community in particular, close quote. And then there were questions of prestige and honor. The town with the courthouse was almost always regarded as the leading community in the county. And the removal of the courthouse, suggest, courthouse suggested a decline. To many citizens, moving the county seat felt like an insult, a belittling of Naperville. And, a third, uh, and thirdly, there was the question of skullduggery. In all the elections related to the moving of the county seat in DuPage, there was more than the usual uh, accusations of vote buying and irregularities. After Naperville lost the county seat in 1867, the citizens of the town were convinced they'd been cheated, robbed, and this strengthened their resolve not to yield. Their motto proclaimed many times was, let the right prevail. By 1867, DuPage was ready to renew the struggle. Under the, leadership of, under the new leadership of Henry Clay Childs. By 1859, he was the most successful businessman in Wheaton and was leader, a leader in civic developments. He was one of the men who brought the first telegraph to Wheaton. He was one of, also one of the first men to join the Wheaton Masonic Lodge when it was formed in 1858. Six years later, he served as the first of what would be ultimately four terms as the worshipful master or leader of Masons in Wheaton. And he had a newspaper, started in 1861, the Northern Illinoisan. This was the main mouthpiece for the Wheaton forces over the coming years. Childs was also deeply committed to the spiritualist movement, which was the contacting the spirits of the dead, which had been an obsession with many Americans since the 1830s. He was president of the Religio-Philosophical Religio Association, and a contributor to its newspaper, The Spiritual Republic. Spiritualism was a lifelong passion for him, one his political enemies would use against him. Not surprisingly, he was also active in politics. 
1858, he was elected as Milton Township's representative on the Board of Supervisors, and he served until 1862. In 1862, he was a delegate to the Constitutional Convention, which was drawing up a new state constitution. And in 1865, he was elected to the Illinois House of Representatives. And now, on January 29, 1867, Childs introduced again a bill stating that, quote, a poll should be opened in each of the election precincts in said county for and against the removal of the county seat of said county from its present location in Naperville to the point of the incorporated town of Wheaton, close quote. The act was approved on February 13th, and the election was scheduled for June 3rd. According to the 1865 Illinois State Census, there were 15,180 people living in DuPage about this time. The county divided for this election along north-south lines. Naperville, Lyle, and Downers Grove were centers of the anti-removal forces. Wheaton, Darby, Turner's Junction, and Bloomingdale were prominent among the northern towns favoring removal. Both sides used newspapers, editorials, broadsides, rallies, and according to most accounts, bribery and skullduggery to promote their ends. The uh, personal interest and animosity raised was intense. Naperville citizen Hannah Ditchler wrote in her diary, quote, Frank B. came and still didn't, stayed until 10 p.m. He showed us his revolver and bowie knife, all prepared to attend the row in Wheaton. They will, today will determine whether the county seat will remain in Naperville. The town is full of men, and all are excited. Uh, right here on the table, we have, uh, by the kindness of Miss uh, Sarah Leach, one of the ballot boxes that was probably used in that election. Is Ms. Leach here tonight? Yes, I am. Oh, could you stand up for a section? Or? Thank you for bringing this in. <laughs> there were incidents on election day. The one at Naperville was particularly illustrative of the human cost the dispute had actually started to generate. Hiram H. Cody on the left and Henry H. Vallette were highly respected citizens of Naperville and were law partners. Most of the important cases in the town came to them. They had been two of the three-man commission that drew up the town <laughs> charter. And uh, Vallette had served two terms as county treasurer. Cody had served as county judge. Both served on the board of supervisors. But in 1867, Vallette, to the shock of his law partner and the citizens of Naperville, became a strong advocate for Wheaton. He served as an election judge in Naperville, and according to the Chicago Tribune, quote, was fairly driven from his post and had to leave town for his own safety. A much later account in a Naperville paper stated that Vallette had, quote, simply exercised his prerogative as a lawyer, but his choice was made at a fearful sacrifice of friend and friendship and confidence. Resentment ran so high that Colonel uh, Vallette was threatened with vengeance, but Major Hunt intervened, and by his courageous handling of the crowd, their intended victim was enabled to quietly leave town during the night, end quote. In Downers Grove, Leighton Collar, who was an associate of Childs and also Rastus Gary, was sent to observe the voting, and he was also driven out of town. The election destroyed the partnership of Cody and Vallette. Vallette moved to Wheaton. Meanwhile, the voting went on. The pro-Naperville forces were later to complain of many irregularities such as in Winfield, where the election judge closed the polls for an hour as they went to lunch. The end result was a squeaker, with Naperville winning by, according to the officially certified account, 117 votes out of the 3,325 votes that were cast. The far out from the election commenced the next day, or next evening, June 4th, resulting in what was known as the Wheaton Riot. Accounts agree that men came from Naperville and assaulted citizens in Wheaton, inflicting wounds on one man, Murat Mott, a Civil War veteran, that soon resulted in his death. According to Wheaton sources quoted in the Chicago Tribune, this party of eight to ten men on arriving at the Wheaton do Depot immediately began throwing punches, rocks, and one man started firing a pistol. Valentine Kuhn, a citizen of Wheaton, a local butcher, grabbed a baseball bat and started wailing on the assailants. The hooligans then jumped on a train and rode it to Turner's Junction, where they were captured by men from Wheaton. After Mott's death, and this is his uh, tombstone, he was buried in the Wheaton Cemetery under a stone that read, Killed in the Wheaton Riot. That stone still stands today. 
a letter the next day to the Tribune by the, quote, Naperville Committee, denied claims that the men were from the Naperville Party, saying instead they were people brought in by the Northern forces to vote illegally and rioted because they hadn't been paid. The letter to the Tribune did, did admit that they were driven to Wheaton from Naperville by none other than Philip Strubler, who was the county sheriff and a Naperville resident. But the letter insisted that Strubler was merely earning his living as a teamster, driving people who paid him for a ride. Olin J. Gary, who claimed to be an eyewitness, although a child at the time, wrote a somewhat different account 60 years later, one in which Mott was not merely an innocent bystander. Quote, the 100-day voters, men who had lived in the county 100 days when they were therefore able to vote, were still in evidence and becoming intoxicated. Murat Mott, the constable, observed these uh, intoxicated men had the intention of raiding the town. It was supposed that liquor had been furnished by the defeated party. In defense of the business and homes, he used heroism, but they pelted him with large rocks until he fell seriously wounded. He died two days later, a martyr. The law that set up the election stated that Wheaton, if Wheaton won, it would have to provide adequate buildings for the county government. But when the county board of supervisors met June 13th in Naperville, Philip Strubler was there, remember he was the county sheriff, with an injunction to prevent them from selecting a new site. The Naperville file forces had filed an action saying the election was invalid because of irregularities, and the injunction prevented the board of supervisors from conducting any county business in Wheaton until the case was decided. The Board of Supervisors managed to get that injunction overruled and proceeded with injunction, with the construction. The Wheaton brothers and Erastus Gary all pledged money for that purpose, and Warren Wheaton donated a plot of land near where the Naperville Road meets the railroad tracks on the south side. And the architect and builder was none other than Henry Clay Child's brother, Alden. Uh, 1867 had been filled with contention and conflict. 1868, 150 years ago this year, would be far worse. A courthouse went up with remarkable speed and was ready for use in July 1868. It was described at the time by the Board of Supervisors Building Committee as, quote, a safe and comfortable jail, suitable and convenient fireproof offices, ample jury and judge rooms, and a splendid hall suitable for holding circuit court and other courts of the same county for 10 years and upwards, being constructed at a cost of $24,000, end quote. A thousand northerners gathered on July 4th to dedicate the new building. The last session of the old courthouse was held in Naperville in February 1868. The first session of the Board of Supervisors in the new building in Wheaton was held on July 22nd. The Board of Supervisors was the governing board of the county. DuPage was divided into nine perfectly square townships, each six miles by six miles, except for Downers Grove, which was a little larger. Each township elected one supervisor. Naperville and Wheaton, because they were incorporated uh, cities, also got to send their town president to the board, making a total of 11 men. It was always men. The three northern and three central townships, composing seven votes, always voted for pro-Naperville, for pro-Wheaton measures. The three southern townships, Naperville, Lyle, Downers Grove, comprising four votes, always voted for Naperville measures. Uh, so there was a continual split seven to four. Nine members were needed for a quorum. One of the most infuriating aspects of all this to Southerners was that since the Northerners had a majority on the board, they, con they controlled the county purse and they could pay their costs out of it. Lawyers' fees, guards to guard the courthouse against Southerners, even the cost of hiring wagons to take the records out of Naperville were paid for by county tax funds. The expenses of the Southerners, on the other hand, came out of the village of Naperville's treasury or from private funds. An 1873 list of the costs of the county citizens had paid was totaled $41,149.93 which would be over $800,000 in 2018 dollars. Almost the first thing the board meeting in, Wape, in uh, Wheaton did in July 1868 was to order all county officials to deposit their records in the new courthouse. The pro-Wheaton supervisors and several county judges did so. The other county officials refused. 
the Southern Party got another injunction forbidding the government to function in Wheaton until the case was decided. The Northerners then got an injunction forbidding the county government to function in Naperville. And a quorum of supervisors could not be gotten up to choose some other site to meet. In the middle of this mess was the county clerk, Frederick John Thomas Fisher. And here's another example of the human tragedies of the story. In 1868, Fisher was a young man of 25 years old, born in Addison of immigrant parents. He had fought in the Union Army at the siege of Vicksburg. In 1865, he was elected county clerk for a three-year term. Later, late the next year, he wrote a pamphlet in German about his experiences. I should say that uh, uh, something like a third of the adults in um, uh, DuPage at this time were German uh, immigrants, either directly or had been in Pennsylvania and then immigrated to DuPage, and Fisher was writing to them. This pamphlet was very kindly translated for him by me, by uh, Gunther and Christa Kasperi, who are here tonight. Could you stand up, uh, Gunther and uh, Christa? <laughs> Thank you. In their pamphlet, in his pamphlet, he wrote, quote, during the first two years of my office, I saw the citizens were satisfied, and these were the happiest years of my life, end quote. He voted for the removal to Wheaton as a Wheaton citizen in the fall election, and he also voted uh, for the election for county officials who were pro-Northern. But when he was told by the board to transfer the county records, he had doubts if this was legal in view of the injunction. After getting a confirming legal opinion from a Chicago law firm, he refused to transfer the records until the court case was decided. To quote again from Fisher's pamphlet, quote, at a large city meeting in Wheaton on the 4th of July, in the presence of 1,000 people, I was called a traitorous coward who did not deserve any trust. And because of this meeting, I could not go to my father's funeral. I would have liked to reserve, resign my office then and there, but I desired to do my duties as clerk faithfully. But at a meeting of the supervisors on July 22nd in Wheaton, I was commanded to do things that I felt were not legal. Therefore, I decided to resign my office. I was willing to bear the results of my actions, but it is painful to be robbed of the friendship of so many good men because of the lies of people who wanted to protect themselves. If everybody's first official experience was as bitter as mine, very few people would seek office." End quotes. The new county clerk uh, bought the marriage register, the judge's docket, and the county clerk book to the Wheaton Courthouse. But many records, especially those dealing with land ownership, remained in Naperville. The county treasurer also refused to bring his books to Wheaton. The northern majority of the board voted to replace them, and shortly after that, they also, in effect, replaced Philip Strubler as, uh, by having William Cohen act as sheriff. A new county seal was also created, probably because the old seal was uh, in Naperville. In 1867, Childs had predicted that in three to six months after the county seat election, all ill feeling would be forgotten. He proved a very poor prophet. Newspapers did all they could to keep the flames high. For example, in August, the weekly beacon, beacon of Aurora, a paper with a large readership in the southern half of the county, referred to the citizens of Wheaton as, quote, shindle-shanked, slab-sided, buzzard-beaked, <laughs> end quote, and added that the town consisted of, quote, a dilapidated post office, a general store, a miscellaneous collection of houses, one third of which are beer saloons, an asylum for dwarfed intellects, and a jail, end quote. I believe that when he talked about an asylum for dwarfed intellects, he was referring to my institution, Wheaton College. <laughs> the county elections of 1868 were bitter. A handbill circulated during the campaign made use of child's belief in the power of spiritualist mediums. The handbill claimed that a, at a recent seance had been addressed by none other than the ghost of Murat Mott, the man killed in the 1867 riot. The spirit accused Childs of selling shoddy goods to Union soldiers during the war, of betraying his political friends in Naperville, arranging for $4,500 of people's money to be paid to Henry Vallette, reducing the county to chaos, and making the taxpayers foot the bill. Despite this, Childs was reelected to the state legislature, and the Wheaton candidate for circuit county court clerk, Edward Hull, also claimed victory, as did the northern candidate for sheriff. Charles Reinhardt of Wayne, 
In other words, Wheaton swept the election. The Northern forces swept the election. The county seat question had overruled all issues. The Naperville Clarion was later to claim that even Jonathan Blanchard, president of Wheaton College, who was known across the country for his crusades against alcohol and Freemasonry, put these convictions aside to vote for Childs, a man who was well known, it was claimed, in every saloon in DuPage County and was a high-ranking Mason, as I pointed out. The Southerners claimed that once again, these elections were invalidated by fraud. The election of the entire Wheaton ticket was considered by the pro-Wheaton forces a sufficient justification for the county government to take the steps necessary for the uh, county government to function. The county clerk went to Naperville to get the remaining records and was physically forced back by the citizens of Naperville. Without these records, the government was still at a standstill. The Southerners had put the records under guard. By December 1868, it had been 18 months since the county election, county seat election, and five months since the county government had ground to a halt. The Board of Supervisors swore out a writ, a writ of replevin, and Reinhardt prepared to go to Naperville, but not alone. Accounts vary as to how many people we took with him, ranging from 40 to 100. The report in the county board minutes a couple years later said 80. Whatever the number, they headed south with several wagons in the early hours of December 21st, 1868. The contemporary Chicago Tribune account gives this poetic description of the preparations. Quote, rusty, robbers, <laughs> rusty revolvers were cleaned and oiled. Old shotguns were loaded. Bowie knives and other implements of warfare were groomed and sharpened. The able-bodied men were called out, organized, and ordered to turn out at 3.30 in the morning. They were breathing vengeance against the stubborn and obstreperous Naperville. The inhabitants of that latter place were sleeping, unconscious of the impending danger. It may be as well that it was so, for had the Napervillians been aware of the attempt, there would have been resistance and very likely bloody." Close quote. So who made up this party? An unsigned letter to the editor of the Chicago Tribune, resp responding to the article just quoted from Wheaton, said that the sheriff had uh, summoned a legal posse from the different northern towns, not more of one of five of whom were from Wheaton. Sheriff Reinhardt had probably been accompanied by the circuit court clerk, Edward Hull. In fact, in an article in the DuPage County Press next year, called this raid, Hull's Raid. An article in the Clarion in 1870 mockingly talked about, quote, the capture of the records by General Sweet, end quote. Benjamin J. Sweet was a resident of Babcock Corners, now Lombard, a northern town. Perhaps more to the point, he had been one of the uh, election judges threatened with violence in Naperville during the 1867 election. Also threatened at that same time was Roselle Holt, who was uh, the founder of the town of Roselle. He is also mentioned in an 1896 article in a Chicago Bar Association publication as one of those who brought the county seat to Wheaton. The same article named Daniel Sheehan as the man who supplied the wa Raiders' wagons. An 1894 book uh, mentions Dr. Frederick Hagerman of Wheaton as uh, another one of the party. In 1860, in 18, I'm sorry, a 1928 history of uh, Glen Allen, when some survivors of the raid were still alive, mentions Amos Churchill of that town as a participant. And finally, a 1981 history adds to the list James uh, Jesse Wheaton, whether the son or the father is not clear, James Wheaton, the son of Warren Wheaton, Thomas Watkins of Warrenville, Albert Jaynes, who was the uh, head of the town government in Wheaton, and Annings, Anning, Annings S. Ransom. Ransom was perhaps the most unusual. All of these men were war veterans, but uh, Ransom was not a veteran of the Civil War. He was a veteran of the War of 1812. Wow. But he rode with them as a 73-year-old veteran. One man not on the raid was Albert Gary, the son of Erastus Gary, and later the founder of U.S. Steel. He had been a clerk for Cody and Villette and was pro-Wheaton. But he was not a Civil War veteran like the others, and he was only 21 years old. In later years, when asked if he'd been on the raid, he would say, no, I wasn't, and I've been mad about it ever since. <laughs> Whoever was in the party, they were in Naperville before dawn. Some accounts say they took into custody a few early risers in the street. Ransom got a slight wound in the struggle, which was to be the only injury of the night. 
They managed to get into the courthouse, possibly through an unlocked window. The armed guard posted in the building were fast asleep and were taken prisoner. Uh, two Southerners, who are specifically mentioned in several accounts as being captured by the Northerners, were James M. Vallette, the deputy county recorder, and Alex Riddler, town clerk. They were either the men on guard or neighbors who had been come to investigate. Alex Riddler had been a sergeant in Company E uh, of the 8th Illinois Cavalry at the Battle of Gettysburg. His lieutenant in that company had been Marcellus Jones, who is now a Wheaton man and is usually listed as one of the raiding party. So they were now on opposite sides. Most of the men began filling up their record, wagons with records. A few scattered to make sure no one raised the alarm. However, in the home of Hiram Cody, the family could see what was happening from their windows. Cody ran to the congregational church and started pulling. Uh, excuse me? The bell. That's it, yes. Uh, Cody ran to the congregational church and started pulling madly at the bell. People began pouring into the street. The Wheatonites did not stand on ceremony, but got clean away. Well, not quite clean. Later, land record books, 15 to 20, somehow got left behind, I, and perhaps other records as well. These either fell off one of the wagons, or they had been in a nearby building the Wheatonites did not search. The Southerners snatched them up and put them in secure storage under guard. The raiding party was back in Wheaton by 7.30, and their spoils were also put under guard in an armed, in an armed uh, safe in the county court building and was surrounded with armed men. Besides whatever county records they'd managed to scoop up, former Sheriff J.J. Hunt complained the Northerners had taken several of his guns, which he had stored in the courthouse. And a later legend also insisted that a certain brass bell had disappeared. The Southerners were furious. They did not call this a raid. They called it a rape. The Chicago Republican stated, quote, Naperville is loud in her denunciation of the raid, regarding it as a violation of the law. Should the threat be carried out, the matter may assume a serious aspect. The Chicago Tribune said many young men in Naperville were volunteering for a counter-raid, and the Ottawa Free Trader said they were threatening war. An angry mob met in the preemption house the same day, as the same day of the raid. They drank and drank and talked of vengeance. J.J. Hunt and Naperville businessman Lewis Ellsworth kept them talking and drinking and that they were barely in a condition to go home, let alone to Wheaton. <laughs> the last angry man was a teamster who had wanted to offer his wagons. Could this have been Philip Strubler again, getting ready for one more trip to Wheaton? Whoever it was, Els Ellsworth and Hunt got him to go home by pointing out that his horses would probably be killed. According to an unsubstantiated story, the only direct revenge the Naperville got was romantic. Supposedly, a Naperville man had been a secret northern sympathizer, and he had left a window unlocked, and this was how the raiding party got in. When the man's fiance, a true blue, a blue, true blue Naperville lass, learned of this, she refused to have anything further to do with it with him. Whatever the actual truth of this tale, it reflected a larger truth that fraternal feelings between the northern and southern parts of the county, and especially between Wheaton and Naperville, were gone, and only contempt remained. As the Chicago Tribune wrote a year later, quote, there's no peace between Napervillians and Wheaton. There's long been a tacit understanding between the two towns that there should be no communications between their respective inhabitants, end quote. However, violence never came. The next phase of this war was a cold one, fought out in the legislature, the papers, the county board, the voting booth, the sports field, and the courts. Childs in early 1869 attempted to get a bill passed the legislature making uh, the legality of the December raid beyond question, but the Senate killed it. He was successful in getting another bill passed that said until the legality of the 1867 election could be settled in court, the Naperville courthouse could serve as a seat of county government. The next year, the Secretary of the State Senate, Chauncey Elwood, claimed that Childs had given him $300 to distribute to help pass the bill, which suggests a very low threshold for bribery in the state legislature. <laughs> uh, the next, the, but the county government was still an uphill, uphill struggle. The four county uh, board supervisors tended to vote as a block against whatever was proposed by seven northern supervisors, seven northern supervisors. 
Also effective was their absence. Several times the board could not conduct business because they lacked a quorum because the Southerners stayed away. An even better means of protest was the prevention of the payment of, of taxes. The, county court, the Wheaton Courthouse did not have the tax assessment books for the southern part of the county. The southern supervisors and the town government of Naperville refused to help in either getting these assessments or making new ones. In fact, Naperville residents threatened violence when the new assessors came to town. A letter written to the uh, Aurora Beacon claimed, quote, every due pager, north or south, would prefer to see the sun go down on our once fair sisterhood of townships than again be united under one banner, close quotes. People in so South DuPage in the southern part of Kane County began a serious and almost successful effort to split the two counties in half, with the southern, two southern parsons forming a single county with a seat at Aurora, and the two northern parsons another county with a seat at Elgin. The Chicago Tribune made the helpful suggestion that perhaps the best thing for the, quote, moral and the material and moral prosperity, end quote, would be to annex all of DuPage to Cook County, <coughs> since, of course, corrupt politics in Cook County were unknown. Uh, in 1869, uh, Sheriff Reinhardt returned to Naperville with another writ of replevin, looking for those missing land records. He searched an old safe in Naperville, in the Naperville courthouse, but found nothing. It was perhaps at this point that the Southerners transferred the six land deed books and other records they had to the clerk of the Circuit Court of Cook County for safekeeping with the massive testimony and other documents they were accumulating for their court cases. There the matter stood for the rest of the year as the two cases of the 1860 election and the tax assessments wended their way through the courts. In 1869, the Tribune had a great deal of fun with a story about a Naperville man and a Wheaton woman who had come into Chicago to get married because no DuPage Justice of the Peace would conduct such a mixed wedding. <laughs> and Naperville began to have some victories. In the 1868 election, the northerner H.P. Hills and Seth Daniels had claimed victory as county clerk and county judge, respectively. But in 1869, the Southerners protested the result in the Cook County Circuit Court. In 1870, the court ruled in Naperville's favor. J.J. Cole of Downers Grove became county clerk, and Myron C. Dudley became county judge. Cole was elected by 21 votes. The victory was loudly applauded by a new voice in the South, the Naperville Clarion, under the editorship of Daniel Givler, a publication that determinedly trumpeted the Southern cause. Throughout 1870, the Cold War continued but there were a few signs for a possible thaw. Naperville had recently began fielding their own baseball team. The same month as the Southerners' court victory, they challenged the Wheaton team to a contest. Ladies watched the game from the windows of the old Naperville courthouse. Wheaton was defeated badly, at being outscored 35 to 19 with four Naperville home runs. The Clarion commended the sportsmanship and good manners of both teams but could not help adding, quote, perhaps the Wheaton boys could have played better on some other grounds. The sight of our poor old courthouse and the memories of the wrongs which it revived were well calculated to unnerve and depress them. They played well as long as they could keep their eyes off of this old temple of justice. But when the ladies began to assemble there, their sweet bright faces, radiant tresses, flowing curls, and flawless figures made a loving picture of loveliness. The boys could no longer look the other way, and then their courage was gone and became easy prey for those who had no qualms of conscience to prevent them from entering soul and body into the sport, end quote. But if any good feelings had been generated by the board game, ball game, it was soon dispersed. DuPage politicians north and south were unable to agree on a united slate for the state Republican convention in the fall and Givler was sure to include a dig in almost every issue of the Clarion. <laughs> Sometimes it was humorous, uh, if this can be called humor. Quote, the women of Wheaton were so ugly that they frightened horses whenever they appear in the street, and the city dads were about to pass an ordinance prohibiting them from appearing in public thoroughfares of the town without their veils down. But most of the attacks took a higher moral tone. The, material, the national news had been full of stories about the corruption uh, exemplified by the Tweed Ring in New York City, 
under the car which was withering under the caricatures of Thomas Nash and the whiskey ring in the federal government. The clarion relentlessly attacked what it called the Wheaton ring, or the removal ring, which fixed the elections, manipulated taxes, and persecuted the Southerners. Doubtless the prose of the Illinoisan was equally stringent, but almost no issues of that paper have survived from these years. In late 1870, it became perhaps the sweetest Southern victory so far. Henry Clay Childs decided not to run for re-election to the seat from which he had introduced the election bill that started the conflict. He also failed in his attempts to be nominated for a seat to the state legislature. In 1868, Lucius S. Grant had campaigned for president on the slogan, let us have peace, meaning he would strive for a, con a constructive settlement with the states of the former Confederacy. But Gibbler was no mind, by no means ready to accept this slogan for the DuPage conflict. He wrote, it's not necessary to inform the readers of the Clarion that it's the intention of the Naperville people to test the validity of the county seat election, and on that line, the approaching election of county officers and members of the legislature must be fought. There is no peace yet. The war must go on until the wrong has been righted, end quote. And victory they did have. W.H. Whitney of Naperville defeated the northern candidate for the seat in the state House of Representatives in the November election, with significant help from several towns in the north. Almost immediately, Whitney introduced a bill to, re to repeal the bill that allowed the, local go the county government to continue in Wheaton temporarily until the court case was settled. Uh, this, pa this bill passed the um, House, but failed in the Senate by one vote. So Wheaton continued to act as county seat. In the next year, 1871, of course, was the year of the Great Chicago Fire. Amid the property lost were the six land deed books sent by Naperville to Chicago for safekeeping. And then came 1872. Judge Williams of the Chicago Circuit Court had regathered what evidence he could and was getting ready to render a decision in both the election case and the tax case. A little before 1 p.m. on August 13th, Hiram Cody, the bell ringer and Naperville's attorney in the case, sent an exultant telegram to D.B. Gibbler of the Clarion. The county seat decided in favor of Naperville. Let the right prevail. The word quickly spread, and the town went wild with joy. The town cannon, a relic of the Civil War, was fired. All the church bells were rung. When Cody arrived back in town, he was met by a crowd and a brass band, which led him to the old courthouse, where he and made others made speeches far into the night. The clarion in the next edition exulted. It was a day and night long to be remembered by the Friends of Right. The paper also announced that bids would soon be taken to build a new courthouse in Naperville, one that the paper guest would cost $50,000, which as it happened was exactly double the cost of the one in Wheaton. Perhaps this great victory gave the Southerners the encouragement to again begin fellowship with Northerners. There were two major steps towards reconciliation in the fall of 1872 and the summer of 1873. In October 1872, the delegates of the DuPage Republican Convention to nominate a candidate for the Illinois Senate from their district actually signed a peace compact. This greatly alarmed some Southern DuPagers. In the 1872 election that same year, the national presidential election, the Democratic and liberal Republican candidate Horace Greeley, Greeley had campaigned on the slogan, let us clasp hands across the bloody chasm, code words for uh, ending reconstruction by striking a deal with the white leaders of the old Confederacy at the cost of the right of African Americans. A Southern DuPager wrote a letter to Clarion using the phrase to discredit any attempt to reconcile Napervillians and Wheatonites and urged Southerners to remember the duplicity of Childs and the treason of Vallette. Then the Clarion on June 30th, 1873 announced, quote, the tack we're about to take may be obnoxious to many of our readers, but we're nevertheless satisfied in our own mind it's the proper case to pursue under the circumstances. The farmers of the West Southern Townships had refused to participate in the annual County Fair. Now the Clarion urged that, quote, there's no just reason for the entire county not to be united, at least as pertains to the upcoming fair. The Elgin Gazette had a good deal of fun with this, quote, the Montagues and the Capulets of DuPage 
will bury the hatchet at the approaching county fair, and Naperville and Wheaton will join. The county seat, fill, seat will expire among the fatted calves of the gritty little county, and the long estranged villages, the rival county seats, will fall into embraces before the rejoicing multitudes. The war drum throbs no more, and the battle flags of DuPage are forever furled. But of course, the story does not end there. The county board had appealed Will's 18, Williams' 1872 decision. In January 1873, the Clarion wrote, quote, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court of Illinois, will soon decide the county seat case. It's, is, not, is it not about time to begin drawing some stone for the new courthouse, end quote? The next month, February, the first shoe dropped. The Illinois Supreme Court reversed the appellate court's decision in the tax case. The next week, there was apparently some kind of public celebration in Wheaton. The Clarion wrote, quote, they've mistaken the tax suit for the county seat suit. As soon as it's decided in our favor, we'll invite you all down to Naperville, end quote. But that invitation never came. In September 1873, the Illinois Supreme Court ruled in two separate cases relating to the election that the election results had been duly certified by the then county clerk and with that certificate, the supervisors had every right to proceed to move to Wheaton. Therefore, the court reversed the county lower court decisions, but gave leave to both parties to gather further evidence if they wanted to retry the case. In Wheaton, the Board of Supervisors voted to dismiss their lawyers. In Naperville, there were no parades, no brass bands. The parting shot from the clarion, which appeared on the last page of the last issue of the paper in 1873, said, quote, the Illinoisan, the Wheaton newspaper, proposes to drop all past differences that have kept the people of the county in a state of unfriendliness for the past six years. Well, we're willing to say nothing more about the county seat affair, but so exercise the right to express our opinion in a whisper that it is the slickest job of stealing that there is any record of in the annuals of county seat removals." End quote. Let me conclude by telling you about two buildings, two bells, and six people. The land on which the Naperville Courthouse stood had been given to the county in 1839. It was county property. The Board of Supervisors, in a gesture of reconciliation, gave the land back to the city of Naperville in 1875. It is the location of the current Central Park in Naperville. The courthouse, which cost $3,000 to build in 1839, was sold for $105.22 uh, in uh, 1875. An 1896 article in the Clarion remembered the old building with a touch of fondness. Quote, the architecture was the product of an age when any building that could turn water was considered good enough for the teaching of school, the holding of courts, or the worship of God. For all these purposes, as well as many others, the old building was used in an earlier day. Close quote. Most of the building was moved away and used to house horses until it was torn down. But the vestibule was detached and added to a house and remained standing to the beginning of the 21st century. Therefore, the Naperville Courthouse, at least in fragment, far outlasted its rival. The Wheaton Courthouse, which was put up so quickly and proudly in 1868, was regarded more or less as a death trap in 1896, and a new courthouse was needed. In July 1872, the Clarion had jokingly suggested that expert house mover Marcellus Jones get ready to move the Wheaton Courthouse to its proper home in Naperville. <laughs> 24 years later, in 1896, Jones was in reality offered the job of moving the old courthouse. He examined the building and refused. The building was too rickety to move safely. One reason was uh, they discovered that when it served as a county jail in the basement, so many prisoners had tunneled out to the foundation that the building was askew and out of true. <laughs> The old courthouse was torn down and a new one built, one that we can still admire today, although it's no longer the courthouse. The dedication was another example of reconciliation as speakers from all of the county uh, uh, participated in the dedication, including Hiram Cody and J.J. Hunt. The buildings were gone, the people were gone, the newspapers were gone, but the bells remain. According to local folklore, a little brass bell was one of the items that was taken from the courthouse that December night. Somehow it came into possession of a DuPage farmer who had two sons. One son attended Naperville's own North Central College. The other son attended Wheaton College. 
After the Naperville son inherited the bell, the brothers began stealing it back and forth among themselves. <laughs> then the bell disappeared until 1946, when it was discovered in an attic. The old legend was unearthed, or created, and in November 1947, the first of a series of football conflicts between North Central and Wheaton for the possession of the little brass bell were held, conflicts that continue to this day. There's a picture of the trophy taken uh, just uh, a few months ago. On that 1868 night, the big brother of the little brass bell was ringing out danger. The same bell today stands in its own little pavilion in the neighbor settlement, a proud historic relic. Among the human relationships, some were destroyed and some were preserved. As far as I can tell, Henry Vallette and Hiram Cody never restored their friendship. They certainly never renewed their law partnership. On the other hand, the relationship between Civil War comrades and possible county seat opponents, Marcellus Jones and Alexander Riddler, not only endured, but even produced a monument. Whether or not they faced off against each other during the raid rape, they had stood shoulder to shoulder in blue at Gettysburg. Their regiment had been the first to make contact with the Confederate Army, and that is what they chose to remember. In 1887, the two, uh, with two other comrades from the same regiment, Jones and Riddler traveled to Gettysburg and there put up their own personal monument on land they had bought themselves. There their names stood together and there it stands to this day. This is the first monument you see when you enter Gettysburg from the west. Henry Clay Childs had perhaps the strangest fate. In 1870, he was by his account the richest man in Wheaton, worth $200,000. But the dispute brought him unpopularity throughout the county. Erastus Gary and Frederick Fisher both brought lawsuits against him. In 1870, he had already started beginning to buy property in Colorado. Perhaps he was not running away from something, but towards something, because uh, supposedly after the 1871 Chicago fire, he was told by a medium that he should start over again in Colorado. And in Colorado, other mediums told him that if he bought two particular pieces of property, he would find gold and strike it rich. He founded a town he called Cristola because he had seen it foretold in a crystal ball. For a time, it was a thriving community. Various companies were formed to exploit, exploit the anticipated ore. Cristola also became a mecca for spiritualists. But no gold was ever found, and eventually Cristola, the spiritual capital, became a ghost town. Charles became a recluse and died a lonely, disappointed man. In the end, his greatest lasting achievement was to move the county seat. In Wheaton, there is a single street named after him. Frederick James Thomas Fisher, the young man who had resigned as county clerk, went to Germany to study medicine. He eventually returned to DuPage to practice, but not in Naperville or Wheaton or Addison. He lived in Elmhurst the rest of his life, dying in 1906. And his traumatic experiences in 1867 and 68 did not sour him on public service. An article about him in a 1913 historical encyclopedia of Illinois concluded, quote, many of the improvements which helped in Elmhurst and were the basis of its growth were due in large member to his public spirit and zeal. To the hour of his death, he strove to improve his own mind and character and to help his fellow men, end quote. In 1871, Thomas Jefferson, in his first inaugural address, described the vicious party conflict that had marked the election of 1800 and said, quote, let us unite with one heart and mind. Let us restore to social intercourse that harmony and affection without which liberty and even life itself are but dreary things, unquote. Words that DuPage's North and South could have well taken to heart in 1867 and in 2018. Thank you. Thank you.